One of the most interesting things is, is when uh, my wife, Joanne, bless her heart, said, isn't it time you left that other woman, the fire department, and spend more time at home? I said, you know what? She's got a real good thing there. I think I will. And there's another thing. With Mayor Durkin at the helm of this city and Chief Scoggins leading the fire department, I can take a step back after 10 mayors and 12, or pardon me, 10 fire chiefs and 12 mayors, it's time to step back because I got confidence in what's occurring now. I've never had a bad day in this department. I've never had a day when I didn't want to come to work. That's an incredible job to have because of the people I work with and the people I work for. I have had sad days. I've had sad days when firefighters are killed in the line of duty. And interestingly enough, I came in 1966, and it's interesting how we progress over time. In 1966, when I came in, uh, Captain Harold Webb Sr. died of a heart attack, Engine 27 in Georgetown. We didn't have defibrillators. We didn't know how to do CPR. We had none of those skills in, in first aid. We did go to auto crashes and, and people who were in accidents, but we certainly weren't doing the things we do now. 1968, Todd Shipyard fire, Henry Gronerud electrocuted. We, didn't, we had four doctors on scene that were pension fund physicians, but the physicians didn't know how to do CPR. We had no equipment to be able to resuscitate them. 1984, Molly Matthews fell off the back end of engine 25 and died as a result of it. What happened? In closed cabs, off the tailboard and into the, into the cab in the rig. 1989, Lieutenant Johnson, Blackstock Fire, died in the fire. What did we learn? We learned we needed better accountability. Then we had Shoemaker and Turlicker and Brown and Kilgore at the Pang Fire, a tragedy. What did we learn and what did we do? Mandated accountability system. All of these were progressions that were made out of sacrifices our brothers and sisters made but we took it to heart and we improved things. There's another one that is not a uniform person that I have to acknowledge right now, and her name was Tricia Conley. Um, Tricia was my administrative aide, and actually she died suddenly at home, don't know the cause, in 2015. She was a lady who actually understood me. She would print my email, I would write on it, and then she would send the email back. <laughs> It took me about two years to, well, longer than that, 10 years to figure out how to actually run the email. Tricia was a wonderful, wonderful lady, capable of typing 150 words a minute without an error, knew every labor contract, and did the job of five or six people, all with a smile on her face. Now, you know it's time when your primary care physician says, you know, you're eligible for a handicap parking placard. <laughs> you know it's time when your carry-on luggage on the airplane is a CPAP machine. <laughs> you know it's time when all of your physicians, not just a couple of them, have retired and you're looking for new kids to take care of, of you. You know it's time when you're attending funerals but you aren't attending any more weddings. I know it's time, and it, I felt it was time when I told my wife, Joanne, that I would be home early, and when I'm home real late and haven't called, she puts out a silver alert for me. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about how the, how the fire service has changed. And, and in 1966, August 1st, I entered the Recruit Academy, and are you ready for this? Five weeks later, I was in the company with, Chief, with Captain Harris, Lieutenant Harris at that point, and a crew, a motley crew, I might add, um, uh, it, it was uh, an interesting, I was the chief's son. And there was a bit, always a little bit of fear that I was going to rat somebody out to, to dad. So we always, at the fire stations in those days, like they are now, there's always a great sense of humor. Most of your jokes come out of prisons and fire stations, just so you know. <laughs> But I was assigned to Ladder 3 at 23rd in Yesterday. That was a big district. It went all the way from McClellan Street to the Ship Canal, from about Broadway to the water. Huge district. Um, and that, in those days, when you came in after that five-week uh, academy, uh, you bought your own bunking gear. 
which was a canvas coat and pants. They only, the department provided you a helmet and a badge. That was what you got. And a small clothing allowance to be able to take care of those others. Now, one thing I will tell you, if you didn't wear those clothes out in a fire, you wore them out changing them because you would stand roll call in the morning and the shift coming on, and this was a three platoon system, 10, 10 and 14, uh, you would stand roll call the oncoming shift in their class B, which was really a black uniform wool, um, with the ongoing shift, off going shift in their class C, which was Sears and Roebuck gray pants that would melt and shirts that would melt. Um, <laughs> You know, it came from the old days, and the reason in the old days they did that was because they couldn't tell which shift was sober from the other one. So when you actually get to why we did a lot of things we did, we washed all the walls in the stations. We also, every time that rig came back from an alarm, the whole crew was underneath the rig, wiping it down underneath, wiping the whole rig down underneath. The challenge with firefighters is that if you don't keep them busy, they're going to get in trouble. Now, Claude. I was never guilty of any of those. Those were all... <laughs> fantasy. Sorry. Yeah, they're all fantasy. That was uh, fake news, every one of those. <laughs> the one thing about being on that ladder company is in one month in 68 there, that ladder company had over 100 working fires. We were busy every day. You learn a lot in a very short amount of time. At that point, when I came in the department, there was one African-American. He's sitting right here, Claude Harris. Claude was a guy who went through recruit school with an attorney there and had to. Claude was a guy who had to deal with people who had not got beyond the prejudices that they had previously. And, but he was a great officer and he was very perseverant and he worked his way, every, he earned every single promotion he ever had. God bless you. Well, when we either burnt down or the, they tore down most of those houses up in that area, it was time for me to go to the medic program. And I think Claude was right. I did want to be a veterinarian, and I wanted to work with large animals. I just didn't know when I was assigned to Ladder 3 how many large animals were on that crew. <laughs> I loved that firefighter paramedic job so much it was 18 years before I took a first promotional exam. And then some say that I was such a pain that they moved me from one station to another, I considered it a career development program. That's how I couched it. I actually, at one point after I was a captain, I attended the entire police academy, where I learned a whole new challenge that police face in the job they have to do every day, and it, and it helped me understand why and what law enforcement has to do. And it's why I've advocated for protective equipment, not just for firefighters, but for law enforcement also. I was two years in the fire investigation unit, and the interesting thing, and I love my brothers and sisters in, in the, the law enforcement, is every new uh, officer that was assigned to that unit, we were, there was a, four police officers and four firefighters assigned to that unit. They're a big arson problem then. But it was not hard to tell. There was a wonderful lady in the police records department that said, well, the new guy just ran you again to find out if there's something in your background. So I learned right off the bat that, that they were really good people, but they wanted to find something out that they could in my background. And fortunately, Chief Harris had protected me, <laughs> provided that cover. Then it was back to operations where I was a battalion chief. I mean, I was a firefighter, a lieutenant, a, a captain uh, on ladder 10. Uh, battalion chief and battalion two. Uh, I was the first deputy chief of special operations and then an assistant chief in operations. So I would have said if I'd been a priest and a fireboat pilot, I'd have covered damn near every job in the fire department. I, I, so I'm, I'm going to have to leave a little early. And I know that I can be the fireboat pilot, but uh, Pastor Joel says that priest part's not good for me. <laughs> Interestingly enough, back in those days, and when I mentioned that I'm attending a lot of funerals but not a lot of weddings, it's really true. In, the, in April of this year, we lost 18 brother firefighters who died as a result of being a in the fire department. And when you look back, uh, uh, when there was a fire, uh, smoking was the cause. It's all electrical now. Everything is electrical. So the end result was uh, we weren't allowed to smoke outside of a fire building. So when you pulled all of the lath and plaster full of asbestos down and you were overhauling the building, your safety break was to smoke in the building that you just put the fire out. 
Sounds crazy, but that's exactly what was taking place. So we always, uh, and when I came in, there were no masks, no safety shoes. We hadn't even heard of Nomex, couldn't spell Nomex. Uh, you never deconned, because man, when you came home, you wanted that girlfriend or wife to smell that smoke on you, because I was a hero yet last night. Um, residential fired, there was no rest work cycle. You just kept working until the next crew came in. RIT teams never heard of that. Uh, and most residential or residential fires were handled with a couple engines and a ladder company. But in those days, we had five-person trucks, and you had four-person engines, although there were a number of three-persons in the outlying uh, in, uh, companies. Um, what sticks in my mind the most? You know, when people have said, what do you remember in this 53 years? What's important to you? You know, I've been on thousands of resuscitations. There's two things that I remember that tell me about the job that the men and women of this department do. I'll never forget a run that we were on, and it was a deaf couple who had come and to stay at her folks' house, and it was a cold winter day, and they had a one-and-a-half-year-old baby, and it was in a bedroom that wasn't heated, so they put a heating pad on the baby and went to sleep. Um, when they awoke in the morning, the baby was burned horribly, probably a Sid's death that night. I'll never forget the sound that they made grieving. That sticks with me. So what did we do? We packed the little gal up, patted him on the back, and said, we'll do everything we can to save her, which was not a possibility. So a lot of what we do, these men and women of your fire department, is work with people in a positive, compassionate way. And that's how you survive it. Don't internalize it. Help them. The other thing that sticks with my memory about this wonderful organization of people that I work with and have had the honor to work with is, I wasn't on this alarm, but an elderly gentleman in the Green Lake area always had an immaculate lawn in front of his house. And he was mowing the lawn, and he had a heart attack. And the engine company came, and they attempted to resuscitate him. It was not successful. They picked him up, they moved him in the house, put him in the bed for the family who was on the way, and finished mowing his lawn. That's my fire department. So that's why I love this job and these people so much. And that legacy isn't about me, it's about the men and women of this department and what they do for this community. So I'm honored. It's wonderful to see all these people here. Um, part of me will stay with the thousand men and women that are here, hopefully as a good example. There are a few things Claude hasn't said yet that I'm not going to bring up. We'll stick with the good example. I won't he, he's going to leave it. He said we're, it's, it's sealed forever. <laughs> anyway, I love you all. I love this city. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.